Please be seated. Amen. Please be seated. Scripture reading this morning is in Kings, 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. 1 Kings, chapter 17, 1 through 7. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be a dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to, unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we consider the text before us this morning. And as we pray, asking God to unfold uh, his message to our individual hearts uh, through the scriptures, the life of Elijah. And so, Father, we thank you that uh, this narrative, this story has been carefully uh, recorded and preserved. These are things for our understanding, for our admonition, to challenge our hearts, to try our spirits, to prepare us for the times in which we live and which are only going to continue to challenge the very things that we believe. And so guide us through the work of your Holy Spirit. We invite him now to be the preacher, our teacher, the uh, instructor of our hearts to take the scripture and allow the, the light of the word of God to shed more light that we have a better understanding, prepare us for these days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I mentioned that in my prayers because, and just in case you've been happening to live in, in, with your head in the sand or in the dark, you probably know that uh, the uh, culture and the time in which we live is not much improving. As things begin to formulate and come together toward those last days of one world government, the different agencies, and the different programs, uh, the, 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 the world views that are aligning themselves all fit neatly into uh, the plan of God. So we, we talk about a uh, one world health organization and uh, European currency that becomes a national currency, cryptocurrency. Uh, and we, we talk about uh, losing all individual identities and all of these different things that are finding their way into government, into society, into our schools, and even into our churches, we soon come to realize that we are in very difficult times. And uh, part of the, that's part of the reason why we are spending some time with Elijah. And gleaning from his life, the man's character, the man's message, and how God used him. And, and uh, we're, we're mainly interested in the, the, the very character, the formulation of uh, Elijah's courage and boldness as an ordinary man to be able to stand before an extraordinary king of evil and to be able to proclaim uh, the reality, the just as God lives, it will not rain, and do it with such boldness and clarity uh, that eventually it would lead to a standoff on Mount Carmel. Well, how does one become like that? We've been looking at this uh, subject for the, the past couple of Sundays, and so today we want to just spend time close to a trickling brook, the brook Cherith. That's where Elijah spent a, a fair amount of his time. Eventually, he would go to Zarephath and there uh, resident with uh, the, the widow. But in both of these occasions, it was a time of quietness. This, is this season of quietness, uh, starting with the brook and then at uh, Zarephath with the widow woman, uh, we continue for the space of three years. That's a long time. But during that period of time, God was preparing him. 
And uh, so we look at that and we see that uh, there is a preparation that has to take place in every individual's life if we are going to be able to stand boldly for the truth. In other words, uh, none, none of us would ever think about joining military service and going right into deployment without some kind of training. It's just an absurd thought. You'd go over there and, and be just scared to death, not even knowing how to use a weapon if you even knew what you had in your hand or the culture or the environment and so many other things. You just don't do that. But yet I think sometimes in Christianity, we understand what the Bible calls upon us. We are challenged to pull down strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We are called upon to be more than conquerors in Christ. But little do we realize that in that calling, there is a necessity of preparation. And one of the greatest necessities of preparation is to be able to know our God. So Elijah's time at the brook Cherith was a time of learning more about God. So the challenge today is going to be to um, ask, basically asking ourselves this question. Do I have a brook, figuratively speaking, do I have a brook Cherith that I deliberately spend time at, that I can have a greater knowledge and understanding, an absorption of this infinite wisdom and this wonderful God, do we have that place? We might even ask the question, has God put me next to a brook? That is a time of testing, whereby my faith day by day is tested and tried. Remember, and the raven brought him bread and, and uh, meat in the morning and in the evening. It wasn't as if there was a waiter coming up to him. How would you like today, Elijah? He was in seclusion. He was in a quiet place. He had no contact with any other kind of humanity. You see, God may be put, have some of you in those occasions where everything seems to be in, in darkness and obscurity. Are we using that as a time to know God, learning more of God? So, fundamental question where is my cherith? Where is my brook cherith? That is a place of solitude. Why is that important? Because if we are going to be able to, first off, fulfill and satisfy the requirement of Christianity to being a believer as a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be able to uh, acknowledge him before men boldly and clearly without shame, there must be a, a, a confidence the foundation, the strength of the soul. This is, I know whom I believe, and I am persuaded. This was Elijah. And, the, and so, brook experiences are very, very necessary. Let's just look, uh, by way of an introduction, the parallels between Elijah's time and where we're at today. And again, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to figure that out, but I'm gonna just take the general concepts that are happening and so, both in the time of Elijah and now, we see the upsurge of unfaithfulness to the scriptures, a desertion from the word of God, a modification of the scriptures. In other words, God is taking second place and uh, the, the uh, resurrection of mankind and his wisdom is rising to the throne. It begins to rule. And so we see that we live in times of unfaithfulness toward the Lord and for the Lord Jesus Christ to the scripture. And so where is all of this happening? All you have to do is watch the news. You just watch even in the religious news and you see professing churches that are surrendering to either environmentalism, wokeness, or gender identity, uh, currency transferred into single currency. All the stuff that is happening somewhere else is coming into even churches today. And then, not only did it just happen in churches, it's coming into our universities, our Christian universities, where the future preachers and pastors not are being taught f basically not to be true to the scripture because the scripture no longer holds its authority. So you see this happening. It happened in Elijah's time. It's happening in our, both. Elijah and us today, we are called upon to pull down these, these strongholds. 
That is, to be able to challenge and to test those thoughts and ideas that truly exalt themselves as a better way to, of life against the knowledge of God. So now we have a conflict. We have a head-on collision. One worldview is saying, coming up against and exalting itself against the true knowledge of the living God, which be redemption, Jesus Christ, the church, the authority of the scripture, and everything that surrounds it. And so these, we as believers, all Christians, not just a few, in our neighborhood, in our marketplace, at our job locations, in our schools, wherever it might be, and even in our Christian schools, we, it's necessar necessary to be able to uh, stand up and destroy Bring them into subjection is what the passage in 2 Corinthians tells us to do. Both are called to readiness. Be ready always to give an answer to everyone uh, concerning the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. This readiness by the use of the scriptures. This readiness by uh, uh, the example and the proclamation and, the, and our faith. A readiness being called the readiness by prayer. That's why one of the, if the Elijah is known for anything in the New Testament, not only will uh, the John the Baptist come in the spirit of Elijah, not only do we find Elijah and Moses mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, uh, where the two witnesses uh, are able to even change the weather, all of that, but we would know Elijah because of his uh, radical prayer life, fervent, boiling, the fervent prayer of a righteous man, avails much and James says let me take you back to Elijah's day. We also find that we share, and this is important to us because sometimes we put these men on pedestals. All a great men we put them on pedestals and say well, I can never be like that. We may not be in their position. We not, may not stand before an Ahab but we are the common denominator that we have with all of these men of God that were preachers of the truth is the fact that they were human. And they suffered weaknesses. And we see some of that coming by their shortcomings. But at the same time, as James points out, Elijah was a man like we are with like passions, saying that the truth of the matter is he's no different. This is that he would call upon God in faith. He had that like we have faith. And he, he would do it because he had the promise of the scriptures, as we have the promise of the scriptures. He had a passion for God, as we, God calls us to have a love and a passion for God. And so this, these weaknesses can be overcome by God's grace. And then this, leading us to the three-point outline, is both must spend time by the brook, Cherith. You just, you know, it's rare that God is going to take you from this to here and put you before a congressional hearing. Now, you may find yourself, like there are good movies uh, produced that demonstrate uh, uh, homeschooled parents that stay, go before congressional hearings and they present their case. But you also know that the writers do a fair treatment of the fact that some of these people were not really prepared for this. And how are we going to be able to stand before congressmen and committees and explain our case to the point that we have to convince them that homeschooling is a necessity? In other words, it points out the fact that uh, there's, there was an absence of prayer and faith, and that's developed as they go along. But for generally speaking, that it's necessary that if we are going to just do the fundamental responsibility, stand up for Jesus, we have to be able to stand down at the brook. And there, the value of the brook for both Elijah and ourselves is to absorb and spend more time knowing God. And so we represent the book as a place whereby we can gain a better knowledge of, of God, not through some kind of transcendental meditation, but by observation, by experience, by study. For example, these three points are not the sum total of everything, but we find out we can know God by the way in which he provides. We learned that from Elijah. We can learn more about God uh, by spending time with him in the secret place, 
He that dwelleth in in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, Psalm 91, 1. We also can learn to know more about God by patience of faith, as we pick that up, as James cites that in in James uh, chapter 5. So these three ideas help us to be able to be prepared, be ready always to give an answer to every man, no matter what their status is, what the location is, what the mill you might be, be able to give an answer to every man for the reason of the hope that is within us. And a best way to be able to do that is knowing God by the brook. That's another way of saying that we have to take time. What was the expression? Stop and smell the roses. Don't try it with the ones that are sold on the corner street. There is no smell unless you spray it on there. It's a nice presentation to your spouse. But you you want the real McCoy. You go to to places that actually have it. But to take the time and observe I gave the illustration last week. I just got to repeat it again. You really have to take the time to go to a place. If you want to see the glory of God in his creation, you have to go to a dark place at night. And in that dark place at night, you can look up. And you will be able to see the constellations and stars, constellations that are lost in the background of the galaxies that go for light years away from us. That is God's glory. Or you watch the reflection of sunlight off of brooks, or you watch deer and fawn, you, you, all of different ways of creation. And, and, and let me give you another good way, ride a bike. Now, well, you might chuckle at that, but let me tell you something. When you can only go four mile an hour, and you can't even hear the wheels on the road, you'd be surprised at how much of wildlife you get to see and hear and be able to just say, praise the Lord, a bear, a deer, a turkey, an occasional dog that come out and bite you on the arm. You know, all kinds of cool stuff happen during those periods of time. Traveling slow, but listening and hearing and watching and observing the mountain views. That is the advantage of slowness and taking our time. Sometimes we just have to get away from it. That's why vacations are are very important. But don't wait for a vacation. Make time in your day. Do you understand me? Make time during your day to be able to hear God, to know him. Set aside a brook. It's figurative language, but it's place of quietness our closing hymn, not now, but it's going to be number 498, Near to the Heart of God, that the writer talks about drawing us closer to God. Let's go to our first observation here this morning. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time with these, but knowing God by provision, when we look at our text, we find that it were uh, ravens that brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So during this period of time of this bread and flesh, we make this observation that God can provide by any means that he wants. Now, what does that mean? That means that God is not limited by reasoning. God is not limited to what would be the natural occurrence. That God is a law unto himself. So he uh, can make the provision. He can take the oncommon carrion bird to grab a loaf of bread from somebody's windowsill and a chunk of meat from somebody else's uh, grill and bring it to Elijah. I find that very fascinating, uh, the, the, the whole idea, why the carrion bird? In God's wisdom, think about there's three very simple thoughts. Number one, why not have Obadiah do it? Obadiah already had Uh, 100 prophets in hiding, of which he's bringing bread and water to them each day, two separate caves uh, where he would meet. Why not have Obadiah? Well, Obadiah might be followed by one of Jezebel's henchmen, and uh, next thing you know, uh, uh, Elijah's uh, place is disclosed. Why not have a dog do it? 
Dogs were notorious for gathering up flesh and taking it to eating places. But then again, somebody out of curiosity would happen to notice, this dog happens to go by my house every day of the week and goes up there into the woods. The next thing you know, he disappears. What's going on there? The other possibility is there were seven, there were uh, uh, seven hundred thousand, there were seven thousand Israelites that had not bowed the knee to Baal. God could have used any one of those that were faithful to Him and would have been friendly toward Elijah, but He did not. Instead, He chose the carrion, the meat eater, to deliver the meat because who really cares where a raven goes? That's God. And the point is, he can provide however he wants, wherever he wants, and by whatever means that he wants. And so we, by watching God do unusual things in unusual ways, by his provision. Now, there's two ways that you can observe God's provision. Number one, your own life experience. We've experience some of that. I'm not going to go into the history of some of the marvelous ways in which God has provided for our family as the, the boys and we were growing up. I told you some of those things. We'll just leave it go. But nevertheless, by your own experience, and you may have your own story to tell. Never forget that. Or you may watch it by observation and seeing how it happened in other places with other people. Either you read about it or you, somebody in your own church, and, uh, and you find out how God provided for them. All of that is to say this, it was God that did it. And soon we find out we can have a greater knowledge of God, of his omnipotence, his omniscience, his power, his might, his marvelous grace and love. Secondly, we would also learn this, that when God commands, that's what he tells us, he says in verse 5, uh, verse 4, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. When God gives a command to nature, what does it do? It obeys. Even the wind and the sea obey him. Remember Jesus walking on the water, peace be still, and the storm stopped and the waves subsided. It was through God that the priest coming into the river Jordan would put the toes in the will water of a flooding Jordan River one mile wide and the laws of nature would be suspended as the waters would pile up in a heap. The ground would become dry as it was with the Red Sea and the children of Israel would walk across into the promised land. You see, when God commands, provision is going to be made. And so that's a, a bit of knowledge that we glean from this. So when we're in that situation where our faith is tested and we wonder, does God even care? Does he observe? He will provide wisdom, ways, means, finances, help, whatever it might be, whatever is necessary, he'll provide. And when he makes the command, not only to nature, to the birds, but to people, the widow of Zarephath, and I will command the, her there that she will feed thee from oil and the flour. So when God acts, things happen. But that's our confidence. He's not just a God that is transcendent and not involved. He is very near. He is close. He is within our midst. He's involved. Thirdly, we will also know that we learn contentment. By the way, just going backwards on this, let me make this point. these, these observations. Do you know that there were two commands given? The command was given to Elijah. You go hide yourself at the brook, and then a command given to the birds, uh, they will feed thee there. And interestingly, both obeyed. Elijah would not have enjoyed the benefit of the feeding if he had chosen another place. You know how we are. I don't know about going to that place. Why would God send me there? That doesn't make any sense. We think by reason and logic. Even Elijah suspended all of those ideas and said, what? God commanded. He's not only commanding me, but he's going to command the birds. And so his faith embraced the very words of God, the very words of truth. Why? Because when God speaks, it's going to act. Things are going to happen. And so in both cases, God worked uh, through his creation 
to be able to work for his children. And we also learn contentment. It was Paul that would have uh, the most difficult times as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there would be times when churches would be able to uh, provide his financial assistance or a place of residence, whatever it might be. But there also were times when, such as with the Philippian church, that there was a famine in the land, and the Philippian church was not able to help him. So during that time in Philippians and uh, in chapter 4, we find out that during this time, chapter 4 and verse 11, let me take you there, chapter 4 and verse 11 of Philippians, it was during that time that Paul writes and says, you know, I've learned how to be uh, abased, I've learned to be full, and in all things and in all times and places, therewith I've learned to be content. And so in that learning process, it's a learning curve that we read about, it comes through experience. It comes through by waning and watching and seeing what God does. But in the absence of provision and in the extras of provision, Paul learned to strike a balance that I will be content with whatever God has given to me. So we learned this. And by trusting, as Elijah would do, he calls upon us to be able to trust in, here's a word that you've heard, we, we say it often on Wednesday night, trusting and learning to love in God's sovereignty and his absolute supremacy. He rules above all things. That is the value of Psalm 135 that we read in part this morning. But in Psalm 135, verses 6 and 7, listen to the words. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven, and in earth, and the seas, and the deep places. Whatever God pleased, that's sovereignty. That's absolute supremacy. A cause the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes the lightnings for the rain, and he brings the wind out of his treasuries. That's awesome. The next time you, you see wind, no matter what the malpower is, look at it this way. God sent the wind out of the wind treasury. Whenever we see the lightning, we are told he caused vapor from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. So these are not just unusual random strikes or the beautiful display. Again, take the time to sit outside in the evening hours and watch the lightning just dashing across the sky. The uh, multitude of patterns that one might say, well, all they do is duplicate themselves. No, no, no. God, is, God doesn't need to duplicate anything. He's always fresh and new. Another way to be able to just observe creation at its finest. Why? Because Psalm, you think about Psalm 135, God sent the lightning for his rain. That's authority. That is supremacy. That is sovereignty. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that only by the brook, quietness, are you going to be able to learn and understand and read about it whether you do it directly from your Bible or you have a, a book to walk you through this, all believers must have the time at the Brook Cherith. Helps us, we learn this contentment because of the fact that God would provide. And in his sovereignty, he used meat-eating birds to feed Elijah Think back, he used Pharaoh's daughter to raise Moses. He uses Balaam, a false prophet, to speak truth to Israel. He would take uh, with Samson and the jawbone of an ass, slay a thousand Philistines. 
he would take a boy, a sling, and a stone and kill the champion of the Philistine army. You see, God doesn't need us. And that's part of brook time. We learn that we are not totally necessary. We are not uh, the, the missing component in God's plan. God is going to act and work without us. He will use us, but he's going to use us for his purposes and not our own. And we soon realize that it is an honor to be a vessel of honor, to be able to proclaim the excellencies of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be able to be part of that army of warriors that may, that one by time in an individual skirmish to say, no, that is not true. The truth is, and to be able to explain a biblical view on gender, on economy, on society, cultural trends, environmentalism. You see, those are things that belong to the, to the uh, uh, culture watchers. No, they belong to us. And each one of us have the opportunity to stand up for the truth because each one of these worldviews and agendas are, are, are violations of truth. It's an attack against the word of God from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, in chapter 1 through 3. It's an outright attack, an effort to destroy absolute truth. And we know this. We can know God by time in the secret place. What is that all about? Well, in Psalm 91, you might want to just take a moment to turn to that. It's a great psalm for memorization, but Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the, the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. And he goes on to describe this knowledge of God, this understanding, this faith that is bolstered and strengthened because... He that dwells, he that takes the time. And the idea is that he sits and learns. Let me give you just another dog example, if I may. Repetition, repetition, repetition. So in teaching a, a Belgian Mal that is ADD on steroids, the only way that you can overcome that is continual repetition of the same command day by day, morning by morning, time and time again. So again, another illustration, it is a toddler in a terrible twos on steroids. And so eventually the commands, because of spending the time repetitively and repetitively begin to become part of the character and the thinking of the dog. It does work, by the way. And not that we're, I'm using an evolutionary viewpoint on how we learn, but only by repetition, only by habit, only by pattern. Are we going to be able to understand the value of a disciplined, structured, dedicated, ritual time with God? We don't like the word ritual. That was thrown out when fundamentalism came in, but yet it has a place. What is your morning ritual? What is your evening ritual? Do you have a time? We have schedules. We are a scheduled society to the extent that God has been scheduled out. It's time we bring him back in. It's time that we go to the dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. What did Jesus teach the disciples when they said, Lord, teach us to pray? Pray in this manner. First, when you go into your closet, close the door. And many commentators will say that's because it's a comparison to the Pharisees who love to display their prayer, prayer life publicly, but there's more to it than that. It is the fact that when you're in your closet and you close the door, you've shut out the distractions. 
Now, it's not a perfect world, and there are demands, and you're going to get interruptions. Thank you, Lord, for texting and ringing, and, and privacy is dispensed with because we had the phone. But then you will notice that if you swipe down from the top, there's a little circle with a line through it, and it's called power off. Did you know that? I just want you to know that there is a button. You actually can shut your phone off. You should try it. Don't fret. The world will not come to an end. Remember, dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Sorry, Lord, I have a text coming in. You know why we use text? Because we don't want to talk. And I say this, if it's so important that you need to know immediately, I would get a phone call. When I get a text, please don't be offended if I don't answer you. A text is just a piece of message. It's like a sticky note that happened to float my way and lands on my desk. Apparently, it's not urgent. And so you have to learn to treat technology as proper perspective as it stands against this subject this morning, knowing God in the secret place. A desert place is necessary. This is where Elijah was. He was in a place where there was no other fellowship. Now that can be unnerving. All he had to talk to were birds, meat eaters. And I don't think he had the time to have a conversation with them. Time at the brook precedes the Mount Carmel experience. That's an exciting story and eventually we're gonna to get to it. But let's just bear in mind that three years of preparation Three years of training, three years of knowing God, watching provision, raising a young man to life, all of this in quietness. The ratio of three years to one day. The Mount Carmel experience would have been one, about one day. Now that wasn't the end of it for Elijah's ministry to Israel, there was more. But that was the highlight, that was the peak. That's what turned the, tr the trend, changed the tide, woke the people up, destroyed the prophets of Baal. It was the day of shining glory for God and for Elijah. But three years, we then have to challenge ourselves the question, if that took three years to be able to do that, how can we expect how can we ever expect to boldly represent truth if we've not spent time in brook quietness, desert quietness, or secret place with God? Don't fool yourself. You'll not be ready. You will not be ready. All of your academic of knowledge about God means nothing. You see, Elijah acted on the promises and before whom I stand. As sure as Yahweh lives, there will be no rain. There will be no rain because Yahweh lives. And so that was the fiber and the fabric of his spiritual life. And so he'd be able to make that solemn proclamation without any reservation. And such as it is, then and now, the preparation is the time that we deliberately set aside to know God. Then God can use us. So, Father, we ask that in our day-by-day -day affairs of life, help us to make that time, have our prayer closet, have our time of just a study. It's a very busy world in which we live. But yet, by your grace and giving to us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, an expectation to be able to represent you and stand before uh, those that are in authority or think that they're authority, that we could be ready for that, being ready always to give an answer to every man or the reason, the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.